Bonjour tout le monde, euh, merci encore pour euh, ce séminaire euh, à l'Élix. Euh, on est vraiment honorés euh, d'accueillir le euh, directeur chez Tim Sharper euh, de l'Université de Saskatchewan aujourd'hui avec nous. Euh, il est un expert euh, quand même connu dans la biologie, l'évolution des euh, technologies en ligne, des génomes. Et il a fait euh, ses études euh, à Montréal, euh, il vient de Montréal, il a fait euh, son bac et euh, maîtrise euh, à l'Université de, de Mekie. Euh, ensuite, il est allé en Allemagne pour faire un doctorat, ce n'était pas suffisant, il a fait un postdoc, ce n'était pas suffisant, il est resté là-bas pour 15 ans comme chercheur dans l'Institut de, de, de Leibniz. Leibniz. De, 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 euh, euh, travailler sur la euh, génétique des de plantes, des euh, de cultures. Et depuis 2015, euh, il a encore euh, décidé de déménager au Canada et il est devenu chef euh, de, de recherche euh, de DIPS, euh, Global Institute for Food Security, à l'Université de Société. Et aujourd'hui, il est avec nous. Et, Merci beaucoup. Uh, donc, merci pour l'invitation. Je vais donner mon présentation en anglais et vous pouvez me demander des questions en français ou en anglais. Je um, uh, ça me dérange pas. OK. So, thank you for the invitation. Um, OK. We all know this guy, right? So, Mendel. And this year is the 200, 250th anniversary of Mendel and his peas. And so, we all take We all take and we all learn this when we take introductory genetics courses. What you don't hear about is that after Mendel had written, uh, had crossed peas and made his first um, publication about the fundamental principles of genetics, he tried to repeat this using hyracium. So, and, and what he found was that hyracium, when he did the crosses, didn't behave at all like peas. And in fact, um, in the F1s, he would end up with tons and tons of variation. And then in the F2s, the variation would get fixed and it wouldn't change anymore. And I think it's a good example of how as scientists, we try to model or we, we, we take our ideas and we force them to our observations. So when Mendel published, when he saw this, he was very confused because it didn't act as peas. But on the other hand, he had this fundamental law of, 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 of genetic segregation, which he discovered, And so he had, he came up with a completely different way, like a two-step model for sexual reproduction, thereby forcing his, his, his observations of hyracium to sexual reproduction. And we now know that, um, that hyracium, in fact, is, a, is an apomixic plant. And so ap today I'm going to talk to you about apomixis. And apomixis is a, naturally, it's a natural form of asexual reproduction through seeds. So all of you guys work on cannabis, right? And cannabis is clonal reproduction, but it's, it's somatic, right? We're taking cuttings and things. Here, um, just as a, a very general way of comparing it, we can imagine sexual reproduction, males and females, they produce haploid gametes, gametes come together, and you have ob obviously an offspring, which is 50% related to the mother and father. In apomixis, the female makes a meiotically unreduced gamete. So a meiotically unreduced egg cell. And this egg cell develops into an offspring with zero fertilization, All right? So it's a modification of meiosis followed by parthenogenetic or virgin birth, essentially, right? Of, of, of offspring, which are 100% related to the mother plant. And, it's, and it's, a very, it's a natural form of reproduction in many natural plant populations. So um, why is this important? Well, it, of course, it's an important evolutionary story, which I'll tell you a little bit about, but it also has a lot of applications to agriculture. And if we think about agriculture today, much of many of the crops that we use are based upon hybrid breeding, right? And if we think about um, yield, so just a maize um, through history, what we know is that maize yield remained pretty, pretty um, on a flat line until kind of around World War, World War II. And then we people started introducing hybrid breeding. So taking two divergent uh, genotypes of a plant and crossing them, thereby inducing heterosis or hybrid vigor. And so once we started doing that, 
then yields started to increase at a very, very strong rate. And this just gives you an example. This is a very common cross in maize where you can see parental lines look like this. And then you do the cross, of course, and you end up with uh, the hybrid cross and you end up with huge yield, right? So think about it. So now most of the big companies that work on hybrid breeding will spend a lot of effort and time generating inbred lines. Right, so you need at least eight generations of inbreeding. This takes a lot of time and money, right? And then once you have these inbred lines, you cross them and you, and you sell this first generation hybrid seed to farmers. And then the farmer gets more yield and the farmer gets uniformity, right? Okay. Now that farmer decides to keep the seeds. So he or she has planted the F1 generation Right? And I don't want to buy seeds again. So now I'm going to let my, my, my plants cross in the field and I'm going to replant my seeds in the next generation. Of course, sex and meiosis breaks apart all of our gene combinations. And so in the second generation, the farmer loses uniformity and the farmer loses yield. Right? So the farmer is married to these companies. You have to buy these seeds all the time. So the idea, very simply, is that once you've attained this uh, this state, these F1s, which are very high, high yield and very uniform, what if we could turn sex off? So just imagine a switch and we go from sexual reproduction to asexual reproduction, then what could happen potentially is that these, these first generation plants would produce seeds clonally. So we could fix that, right? And um, sounds bad for companies, but it's not necessarily bad. It's an incredibly disruptive technology if we could get this going, um, on, on, a, on a great many, many levels. And I could talk to you for hours about this, but the whole idea is um, if you talk to, uh, like here, here's a statistic. So it, um, many larger companies will kind of give you this general statistic to say that any new variety in the field costs 15 years and $150 million. So imagine now if you could introduce apomixis into your crops, you could create hybrids in a single generation, um, because it takes, you could do this in one generation, you could produce limitless numbers of cultivars, which means you could end up niche breeding, right? So you could develop cultivars for east sides of mountains or west sides of mountains and so on. Um, and it's very important for stabilizing traits. Intr farmers would become you know, innovators we could, if we could introduce um, varieties that were generated in developing countries and so on, right? So really, if we could introduce apomixis as a technology to agriculture, there would be local and global benefits of a very, very disruptive nature. And while um, and companies are very, very interested in, in, in this, right? Um, if we talk, so this is just from, uh, uh, from 2004, but when people talk about the induction of apomixis into agriculture, people tend to put the word billions in, in front of it, okay? So it's an incredibly important technology that we really need um, if as we move forward, um, you know, on, in this growing planet. And so clearly a lot of interest in it. People have been trying to do this now for 30 or 40 years. Um, and it's so important. Why don't we have any, any apomictic crops? Well, the reason it, we don't have any apomictic crops is because it's super complicated. And I've just thrown this up here just to say that when people have, you know, compared uh, or trying to understand how apomictic plants are different from sexual plants, they tend to just treat them as, you know, just two different genotypes. And the only differences we think about are differences in the genetics of those two things. But actually, when you really think about it, what we're comparing is sexual reproduction and asexual reproduction or apomixis. And if we can, th and, and so basically when you think about those two forms of reproduction, we have differences on the level of the genome and level of reproduction on larger scale phenomenon, like their, 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 their distribution and so on. And I won't go through these, but you can just see that, you know, asexuality has, uh, there's modifications of meiosis. Um, so chromosomal pairing is affected and so on. Um, asexual individuals, females reproduce clonally. So you don't need males, but we have males in the populations. So there's lots and lots of complicated cofactors which go together with this form of reproduction. And importantly, you need to think about these things when you are doing comparisons or genetic comparisons and so on. And that's all I wanted to say from that. And before I go on, I just wanted to say, so when I, uh, a lot, all the data that I'm gonna show you, this is really is about 20, almost 25 years worth of research. 
And I've had lots and lots of students and really it's these people that I would like to thank, okay? Just like you guys doing your work here, um, you know, you're the ones in the lab doing the stuff, right? So very, very important. Um, okay, so in my lab, there's, there's two, so Appomixis is important. And there's two kinds of ways that people try to do this. One way is uh, people try to induce apomixis into crops is to simply take meiosis genes and then to mutate them. And there are, are, there are processes where you can mutate three genes and kind of create this apomictic reproduction de novo in plants. What I do in my lab is we look at natural populations of naturally occurring apomictic plants and we go into these populations and we compare the sexual individuals to the apomictic individuals. And this is what I'm gonna take you through as, as, as I go through from a talk. And so I'm gonna to talk to you mostly about this today, um, but I do work in a number of species. Um, those of you guys working in cannabis, we've also found apomixis in hops, right? So I'm very interested in trying to get apomixis into cannabis, which would be a really, really nice thing. Um, okay, when we think about, genomics and we think about human disease research, um, what's clear is that, you know, we went from the 90s, we started sequencing human genomes and it became very easy to compare, you know, humans with disease and humans without disease. You do comparisons, you identify genes or, or polymorphisms that are different, right? And then we come up with ideas about genes that are associated with, with the disease, right? But what we now know also is that you need to understand some fundamental aspects of the biological population you're working with. And so when we think about human disease research, we now realize that we need to inc include population structure into our analyses, right? You need to take into account the genetic backgrounds of the subjects in your, in your analyses. The breast cancer genes, I don't know if you know, guys know the stories around the identification of breast cancer genes in humans, but it's a really nice story about how people made a lot of mistakes because they did not, they did not um, take into consideration the genetic background of the subjects they were looking at. For example, if you had, 10, you had a sample of 10 individuals from, uh, from Europe in your sample with uh, leukemia and without leukemia, and, what we, and, and your sample size is 10 versus 10, but actually, those 10 individuals have a common ancestor, right? A recent common ancestor. So your, 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 your statistic is not 10, it's one, right? And so things like that, we need to take into consideration. The other thing is we need to weld, we need to really get a good idea of the phenotype right on the tissue, if not the cellular level. And very importantly, we wanna to aim towards cell specific analyses, right? Understanding exactly what's happening. Um, in apomixis, I'm interested in the egg cell and what's going on right in the egg cell. So today I'm gonna to talk to you about Bukhara. So I've been working on this now for about 20, 25 years. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a brassicaceae. So uh, cruciferae is simply the way the plants uh, create their anthers and the flowers, right? Um, but very importantly, it's apomictic, closely related to brassica, of an economically important plant, but also close to Arabidopsis. And when I started working on this 20 years ago, it was amazing because virtually all the genomic resource, resources we had were from Arabidopsis. Um, so just a quick one, sorry, <laughs> Bukhara, it's, it's closely related to Arabidopsis and Brassica, pretty small genome, um, very diverse uh, morphology. I'll show you in the next slide. And you can see that it's found throughout North America. And there's actually some samples up in Greenland that we've looked at as well. So it's a very, and, and I will say this is, um, this is reflective of a post-Pleistocene recolonization of North America, right? So there were glaciers down to here, or most organisms were forced into the south you know, during the last glaciation, the glaciers receded and things recolonized North America. So it looks normal. What's interesting though, is if we look um, in natural populations, this is just, so there's over a hundred species, right? And this is just kind of an example to show you the variability we see in terms of the plant morphology, flower morphology, um, pollen, anther heads and pollen and so on. So you can see there's a great deal of phenotypic variation in this, in this genus. And the, the phenotypic variation is associated with um, recolonization and speciation in North America. So it's a very dynamic process. Okay, a very important aspect. So when we think about sexual organisms and asexual organisms, when you compare those two things, most of the time, so 99% of the time, 
sexual organisms will be diploid and pure species, and their asexual relatives will be polyploid and hybrid in nature, which means that whenever you do comparisons of these two things, you're, you're comparing asexuality versus sexuality, but you're also comparing diploidy versus polyploidy, pure species versus hybrid species. So, um, and it's very difficult to untangle all of those phenomena to try to identify genes for apomixis. The really nice thing about Bukra is, the, is, is that it's unique. So we have diploid sexual individuals. So uh, chromosome number is 16 in diploids. And then we look in natural populations and we find apomix. Um, most or many of the apomix are triploids as we expect, as, as we see in normal asexual organisms. But very importantly, we have naturally occurring diploid apomixis. This is super rare. It doesn't happen. I think there's only one other species in the world in which we find diploid apomixis. And there's tons of implications about this. But most importantly, when we do the comparisons that I'm going to show you in the, in the future slides, we're always comparing diploid apomixis to diploid sexuality. So we have no confounding factors like things like polyploidy affecting things. Um, Okay, this is a, a, was a PhD student, um, Christiana Kiefer in my group many years ago. Um, and what we did is she sampled about 2000 uh, individuals from all over North America. Um, we did, this, is a chlor, this is chloroplast sequencing. And using the chloroplast sequences, she could divide, every, she could divide the diversity we see um, into actually different groups with overlapping ranges. And you could see that the, there's very clear separation in terms of the, of the chloroplast genome, right? So we have a lot of this diversity inherent existing in these populations. Um, I'll just overlay this. This is the same network I just showed you here, okay? But now what we do is we go to this network and we can, uh, I wanna show this to you. So essentially what I want you to see is that in blue, blue is gonna be the, the, the pre presence of apomixis, red is the absence of apomixis. That's the only thing I want you to see, okay? So we have lots of maternal diversity seen in the chloroplast genome, and then overlaid across this maternal diversity, we have different variation or different frequencies of apomixis versus sexuality in these different groups, All right? So apomixis, despite having all of this diversity, apomixis is also found you know, within, within all of this diversity. Um, I also told you that hybridization is an important aspect of apomixis too. This is another PhD student I had many years ago, Laxama Kintama, and so she was doing um, genomic in situ hybridization. Do you know everyone? Have you guys heard of that? So genomic in situ hybridization. Um, so you've seen fluorescent in situ hybridization, right? So fluorescent in situ hybridization, you take a gene, you label it fluorescently, you hybridize it to a chromosome, and you can see where on the chromosome it is. Genomic in situ hybridization is a slight variant of it, and so essentially what you're doing is you're taking the whole genome of one species and you're hybridizing it to another species after blocking the, gene, the hybridization um, for shared sequences. The take home message is you, I, using genomic in situ hybridization, you can identify repetitive sequences which differ between species, okay? So in this case, I've shown you two sexual Bukhara. These are just the chromosomes here, Bukhara stricta and Bukhara retrofracta. And using genomic in situ hybridization, we can show you that we can identify in red, we can identify Bukhara stricta specific centromeric repetitive DNA. And you can see most of the chromosomes are red, except for this chromosome pair here. And then on top, you see that in retrofracta, we can identify repetitive centromeric DNA, which is green and reflective of that species. Now let's look at the apomix. And we look at the apomictic plants, the Bucara divari carpa in this, in this particular example. And sure enough, you see combinations of red and green chromosomes, thereby confirming what we're telling you is that hybridization still seems to be an important aspect of apomixis in, uh, in, this, in this genus. Um, this is another nice paper we published a few years ago in PNAS. Okay, so remember I showed you that map and I said, I said Bucara well, as did most plants and animals, you know, post Pleistocene glaciation, you start, you know, recolonizing, going north into North America, right? Okay. Then as that happens, 
you start recolonizing and then you recolonize into different niches. That's speciation. So if we look at different species of Bukhara and we look at the, where we find them in North America, and so we can divide North America into biomes. And what we can do is we can look at every sexual species and we can say, what is the fingerprint of your biome occupation? So in North America, um, Bucara divericarpa is, you know, found mostly in temperate conif conifer forests. And then you can see like there's, you know, different frequencies of individuals of the species found in different places. And importantly, you'll see that the fingerprints of the biomes are different between the different species. This is just reflective of speciation. Importantly though, now I'm gonna add the apomix. And you'll see that in every case for one species, the sexual and the apomict pretty much have the same biome fingerprint, except for a few where we have differences as you can see stars. What does this tell us? What this tells us is that we've had post-glacial recolonization of North America, sexual process and speciation. And then out of those different sexual populations, we've had the generation of apomix. So apomixis, this switch from sexuality to apomictic reproduction occurs repeatedly and over and over and over again. So it must be a relatively simple mechanism that we can try to identify. Um, just as a quick one, uh, we, we published this paper in, in PLOS Genetics a few years ago. The only thing I guess I wanted you to, well, there's two things I want you to take out of this. One, um, so why is, what's the difference between sexuality and asexuality, right? So sexuality is good uh, because for many reasons, one of the reasons being is that um, sexuality enables us to purge mutations from our genome, right? Imagine you have two sexual individuals in a population, mutation on chromosome 10, deleterious mutation on chromosome seven, you put them together in an offspring. And if you have those two mutations, it's negative, you die, mutations are removed from the population. This doesn't happen in apomictic or asexual populations. And so we expect a process called Muller's ratchet, which is the slow accumulation of mutations over time, much like you'd see in the somatic clones of your, of your cannabis plants, right? But this happens over large evolutionary periods. And so what we simply did is we, I, we went into different populations in Montana, and uh, what we were looking at actually is uh, conserved non-coding DNA. So rather than looking at genes, we went and looked in intergenic spaces, and you can compare across many different species. So you do a very deep phylogenetic analysis, and you look for um, poly or you look for sequences that are intergenic that are conserved through phylogenetic time. And if you do find those things, then those those conserved sequences in intergenic regions are candidates for things like transcription factors and so on. So they're non-coding, but they're conserved, right? So we did this analysis in sexual anapomictic bucara. And what we found is that if you look at sexual Bucara and you compare them to Brassica and Arabidopsis and other species, we find conservation, conservation in these intergenic regions. Now we add in apomictic Bucara, and what do we find? That there's mutation accumulation in the apomix compared to the sexuals. So it demonstrates very clearly that we're accumulating deleterious mutations in coding regions, or sorry, in non-coding regions. And then the other thing I'll just show you is heterozygosity. I, I showed you a slide previously with the, the genomic in situ hybridization, showing you that apomix are, are hybrid in nature. And sure enough, when you go across the genome and you compare uh, sexuals in black versus apomix in red, then genome-wide, the levels of heterozygosity are higher in the apomix compared to sexuals, as expected um, due to the hybridization story. Watch, okay. So um, how do we measure apomixis? So we use flow cytometry. Have you guys, do you, do you have, you have all this equipment. Do you have a flow cytometer here? Okay, you've got one, right? So what, what we do is, so if you think about sexual reproduction, so we have double fertilization in angiosperms. So you'll have two haploid nuclei in the pollen cell. You'll have an ovule with a haploid egg cell. You have a binucleate central cell. And then we have fertilization of the egg cell produce a diploid embryo. We have one, two, three haploid genomes, and you produce the triploid endosperm. So this signature of diploid embryo to triploid endosperm 
is characteristic of all angiosperms. It's a very, very important ratio. And in fact, without going into the details, the triploid endosperm is composed of two maternal genomes and one paternal genome. A very, very complicated story associated with um, genome balance, parent of origin effects, right? You have three alleles, right? How you turn on the alleles and turn off the alleles. And importantly, two maternal genomes. Um, and, so, and, and so this is invariant. This is a very, very old trait um, in angiosperms. What's interesting is if we look at Apomix, we find the production of not only haploid sperm but, or pollen, we find the production of meiotically unreduced pollen. When we look at ovules, we find presence of meiotically reduced ovules as well as meiotically unreduced ovules. By definition, it's apomixis, so there's no fertilization of the egg cell. But very often, we find fertilization of the central cell. The reason being is that the formation of endosperm is so important, uh, fundamental to seed production that you need, uh, you need for, you still have, even though we've lost the, 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 uh, the importance of having to fertilize the egg cell, you still maintain the importance of fertilizing the central cell. So it's, act, you know, so it just, it's, it's, it's key to making an apomictic seed. But most importantly, when we look at seeds using flow cytometry, we can say a sexual seed has a two to three ratio. Whereas if we look at apomictic seeds, we have all sorts of weird other ratios. And this is essentially, and if so, if you measure 100, 200, 300 seeds from an individual, you can get an import, you can get an estimate of the penetrance of apomixis. So a plant could be 20% apomictic or 50% apomictic and so on. And that's what it looks like. So um, <clears throat> this is another paper from a postdoctoral researcher in my lab, Wally Aliu. Um, he measured 22,000 single seeds. So single seeds, okay? And what we can do, so he looked at 71 different varieties, three different varieties per, per, uh, per genotype or accession. And what we've done is we simply rank them on this graph. So if you're, this is apomixis penetrance, zero means you're sexual, right? So we have all of these sexual accessions here. You can see that we have some individuals which produce about 5% of their seeds apomictically. And then if we go to the other side, we see that we have apomictic or obligate apomictic plants. So plants that produce all of their seeds apomictically. Circles are diploids, squares are triploids. Um, and you can see also that we have you know, some facultative or apomics that produce some sexual seeds, but most of their, their seeds are apomictic, right? Why is that important? Well, it's important because um, when we're, so one of the things I've told you about is we, you know, we're interested in the egg cell. And so you have to go into an egg cell, micro dissect that egg cell. We want to do RNA seq and so on. But when you're looking at the egg cell, you have no idea if it's an apomictic or a sexual egg cell. So we need to have this information first because now what we can do is go into this group of individuals, collect some, go up there and collect some of those individuals. And when we, when we micro dissect the egg cells, we know they're apomictic or sexual. And so we've done this in the past. We've identified uh, two genes up until now. We have many more now that I've been working with Philip. This just gives you an example. So one gene we found, uh, we call it uh, Apollo or apomixis linked locus. And this just, I just wanna give you some, an overview of what kind of gene expression and gene evolution looks like in, in apomix. So for our Apollo plants, um, we find sexual individuals have sexual alleles, apomictic individuals have a sexual allele and an apomictic allele, which we can identify through the sequencing. If you look at somatic cells, so just like leaves, roots, and so on, you'll see that the gene is always expressed in apomictic plants and sexual plants. But importantly, when you go to the ovules, the re female reproductive structure, the gene is turned off in sexuals and turned on in apomix, and it's the apomictic allele which is expressed during egg cell formation. So there's a nice candidate for us in some of our work. We've got another candidate gene that we've identified. I won't even try to, to, to show you what this is, but it's called upgrade. This is also somehow associated with um, meiotically unreduced pollen formation. And very interestingly, it seems to be a chimera between three other genes. So somehow evolution has taken three genes, fragmented them and put them all together into one gene, which is somehow function, functional, right? And somehow associated with the evolution of apomixis in Bukhara. And both of these genes are completely conserved in all of the apomictic plants that I've shown you throughout North America. 
Um, what's interesting, so you remember in our, 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 um, our discussion today in the lab, I mentioned V chromosomes. Okay, so what's interesting is a lot of um, sexual, uh, sorry, a lot of asexual plants have extra chromosomes, these B chromosomes, and Bukura has them as well. And we, paper, we published this last year or this year, and what we've shown is, so um, we have, so sexual individuals, apomictic individuals with the normal chromosome complement, but we've also got apomictic individuals with 15 chromosomes rather than 14, right? So there's an extra chromosome here. And this extra chromosome, just graphically, so this, this would be the original homologue. And then in our population, we can actually identify, there's, there's two different kinds of extra chromosome, and they have a slightly different morphology depending on the, uh, the, 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 the genotype you're looking at. But the point is, is that um, our upgrade gene, this apomictic gene that I just showed you, is actually found on some of these extra chromosomes. So these B chromosomes, these extra chromosomes, which can somehow behave as genomic parasites, right? And, and because they're variable in populations, we tend to think that they're either negative, deleterious, or neutral. But in this case, we've actually can demonstrate, so this is, this is fluorescence in situ hybridization. We can actually demonstrate the presence of some of our apomixis genes on these extra chromosomes, thereby adding another level of complexity to the story because some, maybe somehow there's a kind of an evolutionary story around the, par the, the parasitic nature of these extra chromosomes and how this influences apomixis. Um, just really quickly, um, so when we look at um, upgrades, so this one apomictic gene that I was telling you about, it's very interesting. So these are just, this is Gus and um, um, GFP, right? And so what we can find, for example, is it seems, so, uh, Upgrade is associated with the production of meiotically unreduced pollen, which is important for the production of balanced endosperm. So I showed you a few slides ago with the seed formation. And now what we know is, so when we do all the GFP, um, as, as the GUS and GFP constructs transforming for, this, this, um, for the promoter of this gene, what we know is that um, the um, upgrade is expressed in the tapetum. So it's the outer layer of the, of the, of the anther head Right? So it's kind of like holding and housing all of, the, of, all of these apomictic pollen. And so, um, I'm just looking at my slides. So where we are now is uh, we wonder about signaling um, between the pollen, so, sorry, apomixis is a female trait by definition, right? But we have the, we have the expression of apomixis-like genes in pollen, right? And so thereby um, bringing up the possibility of signaling between the male and female parts of the plant in terms of generating a functional apomictic seed at the end. So once again, the only reason I'm showing you this is to demonstrate the complexity of it, right? It's apomixis, asexual, should be female, yet we have male genes, which are important. So it does bring up the process of selection during pollen formation. So the final part, this is just about five minutes worth. Um, so where we are now is, I mean, I, there's a lot more stuff I could tell you, but I was just trying to give you an overview of what we're doing. But essentially where we are now is we're trying really working hard to try to get this into brassica. So if I can put this into brassica, I could generate some money and then I don't have to worry about funding anymore, which would be very nice. Um, and we kind of have two major things going on. Um, one of them is crosses. Oh, here, I'll show you here. So um, and I'll, I'll talk about this in a second. Um, and then the other part is the, uh, the uh, genomics that I've been doing with Philip. So in terms of the crosses, um, I've got a, so Martin Mao, who's now a scientist in my lab, he, we've been together now for 15 years, he did his PhD with me, and we've, we've just finishing a four-year study, well actually it's a six-year study, but it's the funds of the last four years, and what we've been doing is all these crosses, trying to understand what's going on, and so we've, um, this is a very complicated slide, the idea is we're taking all of these apomictic individuals, we're using them as males, and we're crossing them onto female sexual plants, right? And then once we do that, what we do is we examine the presence of apomixis genes in the crosses, and we also examine the frequency of apomictic seed formation in the crosses. And so that's what all of this data tells you here. I'm not going to show you this. I'm not going to talk about this, but it's a lot of, it's a lot of crosses and a lot of work, right? So this is the end of six years worth of um, work. And we published this paper this year, and so when you do do crosses, okay, so you can imagine parental lines. So this is a diploid apomict, 
diploid sexual. This is a diploid apomict. It's unbalanced. So it's got um, this extra chromosome that I told you about. We've been back crossing them onto sexual individuals. And I also told you that there's variability in pollen and ovule formation. And so when you do these crosses, you end up with this totally complicated scheme of things that come out of this in the first generation and in the second generation. The most important thing you need to follow is here. So out of all of this variation, which is created in a cross, in these crosses, remember, male apomix onto female diploids or female sexuals, what we've discovered is that a very small frequency of our apomictic plants produce haploid pollen. 99% of our plants that are apomictic produce diploid pollen. And then that, of course, has to fertilize an ovule, right? And thereby changes uh, the endosperm balance number and so on. So very importantly, out of all of this, what we've discovered is that there's a very few apomictic plants that maintain the ability to produce haploid pollen. And that haploid pollen can fertilize a haploid sexual egg cell. And in one generation, turns apomixis on. So it gives you all of the genes you need to be apomixis, apomictic in one haploid pollen cell. And that's a very important tool to have. And so um, I'm not gonna talk, this is too complicated. Where are we? Wait, sorry. So where we are now um, is, so we're up, we're up into season five here. So we've been doing these back crosses, right? So multiple generations back. So back crosses are using these haploid pollen donors. We now have 13 lines that were into the F, uh, the back cross four. And we, we just finished all of this um, Oxford nanopore sequencing of all of them. And what we're doing now is investigating uh, the, the crosses to identify which ones are the most apomictic and which ones have all of the apomixis genes. This is in Bukhara. The other thing we've been doing is taking apomictic Bukhara and we've been trying, so we want to get to Brassica, Canola, right? Um, Bukhara and Canola have very different um, chromosome constitu constitutions. So it's not as very difficult to cross them. So what we found is we, we could find a bridge species. So this is called false uh, wasabi. It's not really wasabi, but it is called wasabi. And so what we've got now are crosses onto wasabi, which work. And now we're trying these crosses from wasabi onto brassica to try to actually induce apomixis as well. So these are all things that are going along. And then the final part is the work I've been doing with Philip. And Philip has been absolutely amazing because he's put together, um, we have a sexual genome uh, of Bukhara, which Philip has put together to the chromosome level and uh, using um, statistics for sequence quality. We now have a sexual genome, which has the quality of rice or better. So it's like one of the best genomes out there. Um, Philip has used various methods. Uh, so we've been looking at uh, phylo, like lots of sequences in a phylogenetic context looking at apomixis versus sexual plants, looking at copy number variation, presence of apomixis specific variants and so on. And Philip has been able to identify a total of 48 genes that we can identify as being apomixis specific. And what we're doing right now is we're trying to figure out, so we're trying to uh, do the functional analyses on these genes as well as um, trying to follow these, these, the, these apomixis genes in our crosses as we move towards brassica. What's really interesting, I'll just throw this out there, is that amongst all of our genes, so there's 48, 45 are nuclear, three of them are cytoplasmic. And so we were talking, I guess, a little bit about cytoplasmic elements today. I think there's a huge story to be talked about in terms of the cytoplasm. Um, and so, uh, this, you know, these are some of the directions we're going where I see parallels between our research groups and some of the work we're doing. And I'm not going to disclose these genes right now, of course. Um, I'm trying to get some venture capital together to do this work, right? But you can see how, um, uh, how you know, how this, how this is all coming together. This year we got funded. I got a new Frontiers Research Fund. Um, and what we're trying to do is build a mini chromosome. So we're trying to take all of these factors that I told you about um, and somehow, technically, put them all together into a construct which can, we can put into canola to turn on the trait. So one way of doing it would be to take all of the genes, put a telomere, put a centromere on it, right? But we're, we're anyway, so I'm, we're not there yet, but I am working together with a, a friend of mine um, in Germany who's the head of the first uh, German Synthetic Biology Institute in Dusseldorf. And we're discussing how, how to approach this right now to actually do this transformation. 
So I'm going to stop there because there's a lot to talk about, and I guess we're at the end. Um, these lots of people contributed to the work that I showed you, right? And so these are the names of the people. This really is like 25 years of work. So it's like lots and lots and lots of funders. I've spent about $30 million, I guess, on this research program so far. And so I thank all of them. I thank all of you. And I would answer any questions that you have.